our Sunday school lesson today is entitled, My Part in the Kingdom of God. We all have a part. We all have a part. No one's more or less important than the other one. We're all a part of the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to go into our lesson text. This quarter, uh, or this month rather, is about parables of kingdom truths. And so the parable that we're looking at today is Jesus telling us that we all have a part in the kingdom of God. So we're going to Matthew chapter 25. Beginning at verse 14. This first few words here is important for us to grasp. For the kingdom of heaven. For the kingdom of heaven. Is as a man traveling into a far country. He called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. He gave to every one according to their ability. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made other five talents. And likewise, he that received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Y'all remember Wednesday night I was talking about Mr. Bray and the jars that he didn't trust the bank, so he dug holes in the backyard and hid jars of money back there. Well, this is what this guy did. After a long time, the Lord of those several servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, Thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five more talents. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We all want to hear those words, don't we? Yes, thou hast been faithful. Now this guy had more than the others. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that received... Two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown. And gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there hast that this this thine. I've had it there this whole time. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming. I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him and gave it unto him which had ten talents. For unto every one hath shall be given and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And he cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Our focus verse for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants, delivered unto them his goods, and unto one he gave five, another two, and the third one he gave one, every man according to his ability. You may be seated. I'm going to add one more scripture to our lesson text. If you want to jot it down on your sheet, you can. 2 Corinthians 4 and 3, we're probably very familiar with this one verse. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. 
my part in the kingdom. Your lesson connection there kind of ties in with our, our midweek Bible discussion. There is a flurry around the office. The boss has come in early and left late nearly every day this week. Now, I can tell you that's not like my boss. So I'm relating to this story already. It's not unusual for him to get a jump start on the day, but he has never come in this early this many days in a row, at least not in the last four years. But he is clearly on a mission. He has come out of his office more this week to talk with the frontline staff than he has in the last month. And he has been fielding calls at work from his wife more and more. When he steps out of the office with his phone glued to his ear, he looks worried. What is happening? Is he worried? Should we be worried? Is the boss leaving? Is the company closing? Are we all losing our jobs? How will I feed my three dogs? How will I feed my two cats? How will I feed my one parakeet? For the last few weeks, there has been a cloud over the office. You ever been there where you thought you just felt like something was going to happen at work? Start worrying about all that stuff. But one Wednesday, the cloud cleared. The boss's administrative assistant came rushing in the door with an overnight package. I overheard her say, your passport arrived just in time. He stepped into the main workspace and announced he was heading out of the country on a long-awaited, long-overdue overseas vacation. All the worry and flurry of phone calls have been firming up vacation plans, especially plans to leave the country. We all breathed a little easier when we left that Wednesday because we knew that we would still have our jobs when we came in on Thursday. I felt bad for jumping to the worst possible scenario in my mind but I have never seen him so flustered. He was usually so calm the last day before he left for vacation. His desk was as clean and clear as the day that he moved in. The worry on his face transferred to his assistant as she realized his work would be hers for the next two weeks. Unless she could find a satellite phone that would reach the center of the Caribbean, she would not be able to call him when she didn't know what to do. From company to company, corporation to corporation, church to church, this scene is nearly the same when the boss is about to go on a vacation or a business trip, especially if the boss is leaving the country. As I read that little story, you've probably heard me say this many times, but I, every time, I, sometimes I think, well, maybe it's just a fluke. But I'm starting to realize it's spiritual. Every time I get ready to go on vacation, I always tell Robert, hey, I'm going to try not to have my phone. But if there's an emergency, I'll, you know, get a hold of me, blah, blah, blah. Trying to rest with my family. And every time I'll have someone that I haven't heard from in years. And they'll reach out, hey, I got this situation. I need your help, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, man, <laughs> every time. But thankfully, I have Brother Robert here to help me out uh, when I'm gone. And so, uh, you ever experienced that? Get ready to go somewhere? And the day you're about to leave, ten things comes up. That's just the way life works. The parable of the talents. In Jesus' parable of the talents from Matthew 25, the master of the house came out of the house to search for his three most loyal employees. I want to be a loyal employee, don't you? When the master found them, he asked for one of them to load one bag onto the wagon while he opened another. They had never seen so much money. We kind of, This is kind of going to what we talked about Wednesday. They had never seen so much money. One talent alone, one talent alone, was valued at 20 years of salary. That's retirement money, folks. That's retirement money. Eight talents. One talent was worth 20 years. Eight talents was just an arm length away. 
The boss lifted out five talents and handed his first servant all five talents. This money would take care of him for 100 years. The boss reached in again, lifted up two talents, and gave it to the second servant. Finally, the boss reached into the bag a third time and picked up one remaining talent, still worth 20 years of salary, and gave it to the last servant. Jesus intentionally said the master of the servants left immediately and left his servants holding the money in their hands. But before they quit their jobs and went on a spending spree, they understood that the money was not theirs. The money was the master's, and it belonged to their boss. He earned it, and he was free to do with it what he wanted, but they were not. Clearly in this parable, the master represents our Lord Jesus Christ, and the talent represents the gifts that he gives to us. We do not deserve more than we have and should not bemoan anyone for having more than what we have. Amen? Amen? All of the gifts God gives, gifts to sing, gifts to preach, teach, administer, easily make friends. You ever, my wife's one of those kind of people. She can, somebody that's not easy to get along with, she can strike up a conversation with them. I seen her do it the other day. Uh, strike up a conversation with them, get them talking. Easily make money. You've known somebody like that. Didn't matter what they did. They just know how to make money. Work with our hands. Work with our minds. All of that belongs to God. And all the gifts God gives our houses, our vehicles, our clothes, our food. Our health, all that belonged to God before he ever gave them to us. We should use these gifts for God's glory. Yeah. That's right. Wednesday night we talked about all the things that we have. We have time, we have our health, we have uh, resources and all the things that we could name. Uh, God has entrusted us to be stewards of that stewards of our time stewards of our resources stewards of our health stewards of all the things that God gives to us and we should try to use these for the glory of God the name tag that Jesus gave to these men reads servant although this message is for all of humanity Jesus, when he told this parable, was speaking only to his disciples. There was hardly a hard-hearted sinner to be found in the whole congregation when he preached this parable. Jesus hinted that just spending time in the master's house is not enough. We are called to invest the gifts that God gave us because he expects a return on his investment when he returns. He expects a return on his investment when he returns. And he's getting ready to come back. He's getting ready to come back soon. When the dust cleared, the Bible reads, He that received the five talents went and traded with the same and made five more talents. The first servant was savvier than most. You know anybody like that? They just, they're just savvy at the things that they do. He wore expensive suits. He sipped coffee with brokers and bankers. Many bosses may have worried, worried handing over so much money to one servant, but this servant was promising. This, this, the master had confidence in this servant. The servant traded, he bought her, he bought, he sold, and he earned five more talents. He doubled the master's money. When his master returned, their servant would hand over 10 talents. Nearly 200 years worth of wages. That's legacy wealth that your kids are going to be okay when you've got that kind of money. And we all want that, don't we? The second servant was different. While his stockbroker friend had smooth hands and wore 
expensive suits, not expensive, but I got smooth hands. This servant had calloused hands, and he wore work boots. He knew what seeds uh, needed to be planted and where to plant them. He carried his two talents into town, bought as many seeds as two talents could buy, and then he went home and planted them when the time was right. His work was different from the first servant, but just as valuable. Although he was given less and gained less, Jesus did not paint him as a bitter or resentful, but as a grateful for the opportunity servant to invest his master's money and give him a return on that investment. So we have a white collar guy and we got a blue collar guy, but both had their part to do in the kingdom of God. The third servant stood and watched his two friends run into the marketplace to make more money for their master. Surely he could do something to invest his master's money, but he was no risk taker. He carried around an umbrella on cloudless days. Jesus drew this servant in greater detail than the first. Maybe Jesus spent more time on him because most of us identify with him. Just ordinary people doing ordinary jobs. Abraham Lincoln said, God must love the common people because he made so many of them. Rather than run into town, he walked to the shed, found a shovel, dug a hole deep into the earth to bury the talent. He may not have gained, but he did not lose either. Surely his master would be satisfied to get back what he gave. Some may read this story and deduce that the master loved the five-talent servant more than the one-talent servant, but that not is, that's not true. He knew them, and he knew what they could do. He knew they were different, and they came with their own gifts. He did not underestimate the first servant by giving him too little, neither did he overwhelm the second servant by giving him too much. That is why he gave them differing gifts according to their differing abilities to be a blessing with what they were given. You ever thought about your planning your inheritance or your will? There's certain kids. We all have them, right? There's, there's certain ones that you think, I can't give that to them. I'm going to have to give that to this one. And then that this other thing, I'm going to have to give to that one to get them to. Because we love them all the same, but they're all different. And they all have different abilities, they all have different personalities, and they all have different things that they can do. When my mom passes, she's already told me, she's not going to entrust to us to try to figure out all this farming equipment and what's this and that and what's it worth, because we have no clue about any of that. But she has a family friend that's going to come and help that. So that's the reason why Jesus did these talents like he did. He knew the ability of each one of the servants. Our third friend, though, this is the problem. He trusted in himself and himself alone. He was not overly gifted. He buried this talent and did nothing to bless his boss. And he thought the boss was going to be happy, but his boss was livid. He reminded the servant of his own words. You knew that I'm not the easiest guy in the world to work for. Why didn't you take this talent to the bank so it would draw some interest? Then it would give me a little more when I came back than that when I had went away. Then the master acted in many ways that some of us would deem unfair. He commanded, take that talent away from him and give it to the one that has ten. Before we have a chance to ask why, Jesus gave us this, because for every, unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath hath, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This sounds cruel to our sensitivities. It does not sound fair. The ten-talent servant had enough. At least let the one-talent servant keep what he had. But Jesus was letting us know what matters to him. It's not what we have or how much we have. 
It's what we do with what we have. It's what we do with what we have. I want to do my part to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, many of us might remember when the children of Israel had crossed the Jordan River and they were on their conquest of taking the promised land that God had given them. It had already been given to them by God. But they had to come in and take it. And as they conquered Jericho, the Lord had instructed them. He said, all this stuff, all the stuff in here, you're going to destroy it. And all the gold and the silver and the money that's to come into the treasury of the Lord's, it's going to be mine. But there was a man named Achan who decided, you know what, I'm going to keep some of this. I'm going to hide it. I'm going to dig it. He dug a hole. In his tent, he hit it down in the ground, and he thought nobody will know. What happened was, is that the children of Israel had just conquered the city of Jericho, which they should not have been able to conquer on their own, to the next city called Ai that they could have whipped there. They could have just sent a few men there and whipped it. But guess what happened? Ai whipped them because Achan had transgressed against what God had said and so Joshua he finally come wise to this and started looking around and found that Achan had taken some things and tried to hide it uh, from the Lord the half brother of Jesus James says in James 4 17 to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin now we always every time I think of Achan I always think Achan was trying to hide sin which that's true. But the other truth to that is Achan had taken something from the Lord that belonged to God. And he tried to keep it and hide that which was God's. If we take the gifts that God gives us and we try to do the same and hide that, we're, we're guilty of the same thing that Achan did. I always found it interesting that this parable uses the word talent. It could have said wedge. It could have said any other thing. But it uses the word talent. We all have talents. I don't care who you are. We all have talents. We all have two sets of talents. We all have the natural set of talents that we were born with, our God-given gifts, naturally. We all have talents that we're born with. On that same token, we all have supernatural talents or giftings from our new birth experience that the Holy Ghost grants us. So that's two sets of talents that we all possess. I want to remind us of the scripture again. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I want us to notice that Paul says, if our gospel. He takes ownership as the church. We know that the gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. But it's also my good news as well. Because of what Jesus did. This is what it has done for me. We all have a testimony. We all have a testimony that we can share. An intellect can argue with you about Scripture, especially if they don't believe that the Bible is the God breathe. But they cannot argue with you about your own personal testimony. You don't know like I know what he's done for me. The gospel of Jesus Christ is our good news as well. The third servant's focus was mostly focused on fear. He feared the master. 
And he mostly focused what was behind him. He focused on past experiences with the master. How did he know his master was a hard man from past experience? But he didn't look ahead to think, if I can just gain, I'm going to see a smile on my master's face. So he was guilty of looking behind and letting fear rule him rather than staying in the present and saying, I'm going to do a work for my master. I want to encourage us today. We must look to our present work. I am guilty of looking behind. I am guilty of thinking, man, you know, this was good and that was good and I wish that was here and blah, 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 and looking back. But we got to focus on the present work at hand. As I said already, the Lord is coming soon. Right. Our time clock is running out and we should have a sense of urgency about the work that we are doing. The joy of serving. It would have been easier to keep the sun from shining than to keep that first servant from smiling when he came to meet the master. It brought him joy to see his master so pleased. His master put his hand on the servant's shoulder and smiled, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. This guy had, what was it, a hundred years worth of salary? And the master said, I've given you a few things. Who knows that he owns the cattle of a thousand hills and he owns the hills right. also. And if I could gain the whole world but lost my soul, I've not gained anything, but I have lost everything. I've made you faithful over a few things. So now I'm going to make you a ruler. You're not just going to be a servant. Now I'm going to make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The second servant stepped up with his dirt-covered hands, his calluses on his hands. When y'all get a chance, shake Chris Ledbetter's hand. I heard him talking about how tender his feet are, but his hands ain't. And just like the first servant, the master put his hand on the servant's shoulder, the second one. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over few. Now I want to make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Master did not scold the second servant for doing less than the first. Because he still doubled what he was given just like the first servant did. When our Lord returns, he will not ask you or I, he might ask me this, the first one. You did not preach on Sundays. Lord, I did. <laughs> he won't ask you that if he did not give you the gift to preach on Sundays. I've ran into this to a lot in the past in my in just ministering. Sometimes people think if I'm not preaching behind the pulpit, then I'm not really doing anything, and they all want to do that. I can be the most eloquent preacher in the state of Oklahoma but if everybody's not doing their part in the body it does, it's not going to matter they'll walk out of the door before they ever get in here to hear a message preach I told Brother Rich when he uh, we were talking about hospitality they have done surveys and it's a proven fact that people mix up their mind in the first seven seconds if they're going to come back to a church or not Everyone has a part and a purpose in the body of Christ. He certainly will not ask you, why didn't you repair the, the suburban? Because it needs some repair now. Due to vandalism. <laughs> why didn't you do that if we struggled to start a leaf blower, Brother Arliss? We had a blower here that Brother Andre bought and I couldn't get it started. <laughs> I tried. Uh, we finally got rid of it. We find abundant joy when we use the gifts God gave us to glorify Him and make disciples for Him. If God only gave you one talent, He does not expect you to bring back five. 
He expects you to take the one talent he gave you and invest it to glorify him and bless his kingdom. If he gave you two, he expects you to use both of them for his glory and bless his kingdom. If he gave you five, be thankful. You know some people, they're just charismatic. And everything they do, touch, turns to gold. There's just some people like that. If you're one of them, be thankful and use those talents to point people to Jesus, not to you, but point them to Jesus. As Jesus said in Luke 12, to whom much is given, much is required. Use those gifts as a means to bring glory to, to the kingdom of God. There is a great joy in glorifying God and using his gifts to make disciples for him. In closing, if you open that door and look on the other side, I don't know who, if it was Brother Grissom or, or Brother Lonnie Smeltzer or who it was that, that had the drive to put that sign on that door, but it's been here ever since. It was here before I got here. It says, everyone a minister. So as we come into the sanctuary, from that into the sanctuary, we're reminded that everyone is a minister. Think about the skills you have. The things that you love to do and are able to do. These skills do not have to be pulpit or even platform gifts. They can be baking. Who knows someone in our church loves to bake? They can be building. They can be repairing. They can be typing. Knitting. Designing. Writing and so forth. And so forth. Think about your God-given gifts. Then think about ways you could use those God-given gifts to glorify God and bless His kingdom. Maybe you can help bake for guests who come on Sundays. Maybe you can help keep the church clean, good repair. We all do that, don't we? If we had some designers, maybe Samuel will be a digital designer one day. He could help us with all that and bless the kingdom of God. God's not impressed by how many talents we have. Remember that they all belong to him anyway. From what we have and what we have learned from this parable, he is more interested in how we are using the many or few gifts that we have for the glory of God. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, the enemy can... He has a way of, of making us feel like we're devalued and we have nothing to offer let me tell you something, a smile goes a long way. Will you stand with me? Not a fake smile, but a genuine smile. Letting someone know, we're so glad that you're here to worship with us today. That's worth a lot. Someone may be in a day where there's not much to smile about. But I can give them a smile. And I can give them a sincerity that tells them Jesus really loves you. You can really be forgiven here today. There's real people that really love you today. You can't put a price tag on that. Will you raise your hands with me? God, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to put my hands to the plow if need be. Help me, Lord, to go to Wall Street and trade and barter if need be. Help me, Lord, if, uh, if i got to dig some ditches just do general labor. And that's what you've called me to do. I want to do it, God, for your glory 
and to increase your kingdom. Every eye, Lord, that may fall on me, that may be necessary for a time, but Lord, I want to turn those eyes from me and I want to have them looking to you. Help me, Lord, to use every talent. Help me, God, to use every gift. Help me, Lord, to use every resource that you have entrusted to me. You've trusted me with it, God. Help me, Lord, to, to take value in that. And God, help me to invest, Lord. I need to have some skin in the game. Help me, Lord, to invest and to bring an increase for your soon coming. Hallelujah. Each and every one in here, no matter age, no matter background, no matter culture or any otherwise, everyone in here has someone that you could reach that I cannot reach and vice versa. God has called each and every one of us to be. That word minister means servant. God's called each and every one of us to be a servant to be a minister.